Pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a night and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god, no thank you. Number seven, public delifing. There were jails and dungeons in medieval times, sure, make no mistake of that. However, a lot of times sentencing for crimes would often lead you to losing your head, where a large sweaty man, such as myself, wearing a black cloth mask would take a very sharp axe, sword, or any other sharp utensil of war from the war cabinet and liberate your head from your shoulders. Thing is, some folks would come out to watch this, as this was apparently a form of entertainment. I mean, why not? I guess, sure. Sure, it's, it's friendly family fun. Bring the youngins, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Pack some sandwiches just to make sure, just make sure you stay out of the splash zone. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know why they did that. That was pretty common. That's weird. Number six, Wario shoes. Fashion. I'm not a fashion guy, and I don't claim to be. I don't have the cash flow for it. But one day, I swear, if I got the do re me, it'll be leisure suits and Frank Sinatra every time I sit down to eat a meal. Gotta have those shoes to match that Frank energy. Shoes that say, yes, I'm moderately talented and handsome and have a great following, but I have some shady connections to the Italian Mafia. Huh, 
villain energy. Well, what's more villainous than a pair of Wario shoes? Yes, some medieval shoes were big and pointy and sometimes floppy. It was a sign of wealth, class, prestige, and the calling card of a portly Mario doppelganger. Surely you might not even wear these bad boys outside, but that's because you trip and fall. and. I wouldn't want to trip and fall out there. I feel like any injury back then is uh, not good for your health. A cut could kill you, you know, you don't want that. Number five, animals on trial. All right, look, this one just doesn't make any sense. Zero sense. Law and Order. Besides being a great TV show, some would say it's the best thing we've ever come up with. Actual Law and Order, not the show. Thank goodness the system is perfect and never fails anyone ever. Well, they used to put animals on trial. I'm gonna say that again. They used to put animals on trial. Not sure how that works though. When cross-examining the witness, at what point do you call this BS? When you realize there's a barnyard animal on trial for a crime, or when the witness response is moo or oink. Like what, you know? Like I don't know, it's, it's just silly. Unless people in the dark ages could actually talk to animals, and we since lost that ability as people, Nah, I'm just kidding. That's just weird. Just don't do that. Don't don't put animals on trial, dude. Number four, consummation of the union. I know I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. This is a story just as old as time itself. You get married. Pope's happy. Dad's happy with it. Mom's happy. You got a blushing bride. What more do you need? That sounds great, right? Well, well, uh, things would be great, but you have to sign off on the marriage. Cross your T's, dot your I's, so to speak. Train going into the tunnel, the bedroom dance, the hanky panky. What bad marriages only do on birthdays and Hanukkah? Yeah, you know. Well, if that isn't depressing enough, how about having the family come and watch like they just subbed to ye the OnlyFans? No, not just your family, but religious nobles, respectable people in your community. And they're going to watch you do the deed. They're there to make sure the marriage is complete. I just... Do you, do you cheer on? I don't know, like, that's just so weird. Number three, pale skin. Ladies, beauty, and the industry. Look, there's a lot of things that can bring you up, bring you down. The makeup industry can be kind of tough to wrap your head around. It's, it's crazy, I know that. And there's been some crazy ideas out there throughout history. I think Medieval Times takes the cake though. You start with hair. All right, so we're going for the George Costanza look. Balding or receding hairline, beautiful. No eyebrows and no eyelashes, oh, even better. If this look wasn't enough for you, now you gotta make your skin pale. Like really pale. And the only sure way to do that, ladies, is bloodletting, which I hate talking about every time it comes up. I hate it, dude. Time to bleed for beauty, ladies, and as if that's not already done already. You let some blood go and you feel a little lightheaded, but now you're finally ready for the ball. Look, the hair thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't define anything. Wear it how you want. Please don't hurt me, Will Smith. But the blood thing? I just, I can't recommend that to anyone. Don't don't lose your blood for to, to go pale. I, oh, that's a horrible feeling. Number two, Dracula's grave. Vampires, they're real. Sadly though, they're not as gorgeous as the ones seen on the big screen and TV. Well, at least the people in medieval Europe thought they were real. So real that they used to take extra measures to make sure they could sleep soundly at night. Don't want your precious life juice sucked out of your neck. Unless it's for beauty, because that's normal. Do you have a family member who always checks to see if the oven is turned off before you leave the house? Well, this is kind of like that, except it was burials and driving wooden stakes to the hearts of cadavers. Just in case, you know? A little vampire insurance, if you will. We went from being afraid of those who fear garlic to wanting to date them. How the tables have turned. Number one, knight, knighthood. As cool as it may seem in the movies or games, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of it. Knights were warriors of a noble class who started learning and training at a very young age. Squires and knighthood. A militaristic education ain't the worst thing ever, sure, but it's, it's the war and fighting itself that scares me. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat we're talking about here. Swords and shields, bows and arrows, horseback warfare. Nothing can fully prepare you for that. Personally, the armor is not an issue. Not moving around in it, it's actually more flexible than you might think. Seriously, look, at it is, it's more flexible. It's the idea of trying to take off the armor after returning from battle and running around and slaying the enemy all day. Yeah, chafing in metal cannot be fun, just saying. Kick it off the list at number 10, black cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory IX, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. 
things. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now at first when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well, even going back Further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman law laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chud. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, good game. At number seven, soccer. These days, people regard soccer, or football, as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around for a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't really have a name, and there were no rules either. The only thing people followed when playing this game was the objective of winning. Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary besides deliberately offing people, of course. Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free-for-all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the city in future. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would really be intent if it hadn't. And number six, too much poop. Here's a real downside to being a knight in the medieval era. While we've been taught that knights were these amazing, brave, chivalrous men that would rescue a princess and live happily ever after, the reality is they were a bunch of dudes on a muddy battlefield with poor hygiene that were literally pooping themselves to death. Many knights who embarked on crusades had a lot of parasites and diseases, and one illness that proved most problematic was dysentery. Dysentery is an illness that basically causes super poops due to a parasite. So these knights were out trying to win back the Holy Lands while their tum-tums were throwing up gang signs and getting mad rumbly on the battlefield. 
It is believed that these knights contracted dysentery through drinking tainted water. And because medicine was basically a myth at this point, once you contracted dysentery, you could basically kiss your life and your stomach contents goodbye. The most famous case of death by butt explosion was from the Seventh Crusade where Louis IX had contracted dysentery and had his pants cut because he was tired of having to pull them down every time he felt a rumbly in his tumbly. It all sounds like such a terrible way to go and a serious downside of being a knight. At number five, unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in the religious text, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used unicorns to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point, as during the Middle Ages, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorns corn horns. At number four, divorce by combat. Back in the dark ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring and settle their disputes and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than having just an all-out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands tied behind his back, while the wife ran around in circles with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? At number three, Animal Court. I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found some bizarre ways of trying to see if someone was accused of witchcraft, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals, from livestock to pets and even insects, were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial the most for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of an unnatural crime of laying an egg. And even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be a quote, virtuous and well-behaved animal, end quote. These people had just way too much time on their hands. And number two, yummy people. As you could probably imagine for medieval knights, desperate times called for desperate measures. Oftentimes during battles, supplies would run out and knights would be left dealing with starvation on top of everything else they were going through. This proved to be quite a huge problem during the Crusades because after supplies and food started running out, people got desperate and started seeing each other as snacks, if you know what I mean. Some of the poorest crusaders resorted to eating people to get them through the journey to take back the Holy Lands, and as you can imagine, it was a pretty gory sight to see. Knights back then recalled seeing enemy forces on spits and dismembered people lying around in plain view. It was rough being a knight back then, and the amount of shortcuts and strategies people came up with just to survive got real dark real fast. And finally, at number one, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage. But later on in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament and this sacrament had to be consummated. They would do the good old brown chicken brown cow, boom boom pow, OMG wow, which would have been a positive or a negative experience depending on the circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, 
grab the popcorn, we're watching a live show on a Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, you'll bet. Yes, that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that their marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything actually happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks. Can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just guy with a stick over a building, are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and Voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly, yeah. The poor guy bridged to Terabithia himself, so I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. 
That's there we go. Who to crack in the mic? The iron chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say it, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used. You know, like I mentioned, the ducking stool in part one. That was that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs. So you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles. It was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything's similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, which is, they were not cursed. They just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. It's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pool vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches, people who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now, of course, people were left there to die a lot, but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep, 
I wonder what house this pig would belong into. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night, not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook-off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with, more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Yep, that's history. Picking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man, trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. 
that's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, a jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II for instance in 1306 had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic. But soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical. Farter. Brain in. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far, off with their head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades Crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number 5. Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky, and also not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So, because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number four, the mystery of Ludlow Castle. Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night, he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number three, secret passageways. If I am ever. <laughs> ever in my life, able to actually afford a house. We'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library. Like both. 
both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it, because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the Postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls, they could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corfe Castle during the Siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the Postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number 2. Where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often and make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos 
just like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. Number 7. War of the Bucket One could make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially due to the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like baloney, but it's Modena. I think it's Bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs, one supporting the Emperor, one supporting the Pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. Except actually during my research it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It's kind of gets a little muddy there because it's a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number 6, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes! <laughs> Ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes? The garment of the devil. Get him! Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310 in the French town of Roon, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he had been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples. It's sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh oh, call the medieval police, uh oh. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtip. The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a Bucktooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Ooh, awkward. Number 4, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of Defender of the Faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> do you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here, too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic community, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here? When mom says get out of bed, 
you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval Times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics, and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queasy at night. Blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time a side in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, beyond, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course, one of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't, I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. The poor guy suffocated in his own what a horrible way to go out. One of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, no objections. So obviously, with a lot of people marrying willy-nilly, a lot of marriages mostly made people miserable. Maybe. Enemies to Lovers is my favorite book trope, so who knows how spicy things actually got. I hate you, I love you, next day, I don't know. But the famous line, speak now or forever hold your peace, only got introduced in 1215 to try and flush out drama before they couldn't go back. In the Middle Ages, drama discovered after marriage vows were exchanged caused major problems since divorce wasn't easy or, you know, 
Accepted. We will get to that later. For instance, Joan of Kent, who was known for marrying Edward the Black Prince and mothering Richard II, had a secret marriage when she was 12 years old. She didn't get approved. In her early teens, she was married to an aristocrat, but the secret marriage was discovered after eight years. The papal court had to overturn it and return her to her knight. He died 11 years later, and it was after that that her cousin Edward married her. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that little detail before she married the aristocrat guy? Yeah, probably. Would have saved a lot of heartbreak. Hence why the Speak Now or Forever Hold Your Peace was introduced. At number six, shoes. Back in the days of old, shoes were apparently a huge staple in society. They were pointy and weird and expensive and complicated and were even integrated into marriage practices. During the wedding ceremony, it was a tradition for the father of the bride to take one of the bride's shoes and give it to the groom. The groom would then tap the bride on the head with the shoe in a token of his authority. But the shoe traditions don't stop at bopping people on the head like little bunny poo poo. You know how these days there's a tradition of throwing the bouquet at weddings, and apparently whoever catches it is the next to get married? Well, that tradition sort of came from the medieval tradition of throwing shoes at weddings. Instead of throwing flowers, brides would throw shoes at their bridesmaids to determine who was next to walk down the Aisle. Now this whole bride throwing things idea has failed me before because I caught a bouquet once and I'm as single as ever so maybe someone needs to chuck a shoe at me or something this time. Please. Number five, the bedroom trial. So divorce, again, wasn't a thing. On the upside of dying early, it potentially meant that you weren't locked in a marriage for too long. If the marriage did end, it wasn't a divorce, it was an annulment, which was very expensive. A common reason this happened was due to consanguinity, which was close relations by blood or marriage, which was forbidden. Other grounds would be adultery, leprosy, and impotency. Also failure to concede to the marriage debt, which was the obligation for both spouses to engage sexually. It actually didn't matter where this happened. And you had to do it even if it was in a church. It was a big deal. Enter the bedroom trial. Court cases from the 14th century show records that bedroom trials took place that would determine whether a marriage should continue. The bedroom part is exactly as it sounds. The man and the woman were placed in a bed together and were to be watched by the wise women for several nights. If over the course of the night the man's member remains of no use, i.e. impotence, then it was determined that the marriage should end. But the wise women were most likely either complete strangers strangers or the groom's grandmother. So I doubt that would have helped with the getting it up part. Poor guys. At number four, marrying the country. If you married an entire country, does that count as polygamy? Are you technically married to everyone in the country or just the one country as a singular unit? These are the shower thoughts that I wish I could ask medieval queens, but unfortunately they died a long, long time ago along with their marriage secrets and probably some recipes for poison too. Back to this whole marrying the country idea though. Back in the medieval age, when someone became queen, they had to get married more than once. For them, it wasn't just about marrying their spouse, they also had to marry their country. This process was called consecration, and it was something that a ruler had to go through in order to be a legitimate queen. The queen would go through a symbolic marriage to the realm, complete with prayers and a blessing and a ring and a crown. It was essentially like a real wedding, except the groom was a nation of people. Sounds like a happy marriage to me. Yeah. Number three, the veil. As we have determined so far in our list, love wasn't the primary reason for marriage, especially for nobles. So as a result, there were quite a significant amount of arranged marriages. Besides the symbolism of humility and purity, it was also used as a way of disguising the bride entirely. The bride would often be wrapped from head to toe to protect her from evil spirits. This tradition goes all the way back to ancient Roman times. That's one explanation, but during arranged marriages, it was more literally used to hide the face of the bride from the groom. So so if he didn't like what he saw after he literally unwrapped the package, well, too bad, she's yours now. Eventually veils progressed to being much smaller, but the tradition of revealing the bride to the husband to declare ownership remained a tradition, even to this day, kind of, except now it's more romantically idealized. Do you see Priyanka Chopra's awesome veil and that, you know the one. At number two, long distance marriage. You know how during the pandemic, people started having Zoom weddings? Well, in a way, people have been doing something similar since the medieval ages. Back then, a lot of weddings were simply for political reasons, and so a big ceremony was rarely needed. So when two people from different kingdoms were getting married, they didn't necessarily need to be there for the wedding. Instead, they could send proxies and have someone marry their new spouse on their behalf. This would be the legal binding of marriage, you know, the paper work side of things, but once both parties could finally meet in person, then they would hold a second ceremony with all the pomp and circumstance that you would expect. And yes, it still included the whole watching the consummation thing. Ew. 
This proxy marriage actually happened to Marie Antoinette and her brother was her proxy until she could get to the formal ceremony. So now we know that even back then you didn't have to show up on time to your own wedding and you could just get someone else to do it. Sounds a little cold to me but like I've said before, love is dead and it died a long time ago. Mic drop, thank you. Number one, last but not least and this is the most messed up, the Lord's Rite. This one is definitely the most messed up tradition and I don't even know how it was justified in the first place, like why was it even in place? Someone clearly clearly made this happen so they could piss people off. The last thing anyone wants at their wedding is someone interfering with the wedding night. As we know, people for the most part had to observe the ceremony, but the Lord's right was something even more horrific. The Droit de Seigneur was a feudal right that existed in medieval Europe that gave the Lord of the land the right to sleep with the bride on the first night of the marriage. That's right, so most often they would take the bride's virginity. Now just how often this rite was carried through is debated, but if your lord had a particular vendetta against you, it wouldn't be surprising. This rite could also extend to a lord taking the virginity of every woman in the village, even if they didn't want to get married, it was ridiculous. However, late middle age and renaissance era texts don't clearly determine whether this practice ever occurred. Texts from 15th century Switzerland references the Lord of Mar demanding the right of the first night or a hefty fee, so either you pay for it or I do it. The Dwight de Seigneur was depicted in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, which added to the infamy of the idea, but no physical evidence determines whether any lord actually did it, but it did technically exist. Gross. Number 10, Nazi Nazi. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You could be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse, or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. What? Don't even ask. What? Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. 
As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red, black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, who, who thought? Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy, but I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. And the next guy who became pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War! What is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I'm going to do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two maybe, we'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical, we'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with limited supplies, which meant sometimes armies pay Village. Mm hmm yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is gonna cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back, like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number three, criminal cook-off. Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice! Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number two, Pope Not So Innocent the Third. Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about popes so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now. That didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. 
The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simone de Montfort said, Destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering, or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes, they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. Disgusting. Number 10, watch party. Marriage, nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the middle ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit. And one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly. No, instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love. It was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view. But I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia. A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice, just like his Gotham counterpart? No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number eight. Red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village or even from two different opposing villages and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but, well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death 
by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or, you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh, many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay. Yeah. I would say this is the 
easiest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible, they're not really a thing, they didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming, so maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck, piles of it, just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Number 10, apple bobbing. Okay folks, time to paint a picture for you. I love doing this. It's a warm summer night. You're at the county fair. You've managed to eat enough fried food to feed a large family. And even more surprisingly, you fit into those blue jeans. They're tight. The sound of carnival games and people having fun pollutes the background. That's when you see her. She's tall, blonde, and is wearing a pair of cowboy boots. Yeehaw. She calls you over. There's an apple bobbing game. You've never bobbed for apples before, but to impress the pretty lady in cowboy boots, you go for it anyway. You fail, and now you're cold, wet, and ladyless. Yes, this fine American carnival game gets its roots from the Middle Ages. It's simple, fun, and no matter what time period you live in, sometimes it was even used as a form of dating, which is kind of weird actually. Names were written on the apples, kind of like speed dating, and then you'd bob for them, and then you'd go off of whoever's name was on the apple. I I've done it before, I'm not very good at apple bobbing and now I'm just cold, wet, and maidenless. Number nine, Kitty Bonfire. This is the worst. Yeah, I've talked a lot about a lot of naughty stuff in my time here as the king of the hive, but this one, it just sucks, dude. Look, we've all been bored before. I have too. Have we all done stupid things when we're bored? Yes. Remember Roman candles? You point them at each other, you shoot the fireworks at each other. Some of you done it. Don't lie to me, I know you did. Sure, that's just a part of growing up though. However, growing up in the Middle Ages, and more specifically in France, uh, they liked to have barbecues. Except it wasn't delicious mouth-watering ribs or chicken, it was cats. And it wasn't for eating, but just for entertainment. Yeah, just for a, a, a good old laugh. Uh, don't have time today, but I've got a great story about a stray cat. Maybe I'll, I'll use that for my first stand-up routine, we'll see. But regardless, I'm just trying to have fun in this one because it just makes me sad. Let's move on to the next one. Number eight, mob football. Football is the world sport. Name a country, they probably have a team in it. And Canada might even bring the cup home this year, boys and girls. Now that would be cool. However, uh, the billion dollar sport was nothing close to what it is today. Football has rules, regulations, and athletes performing at peak performance. Ronaldo was one heck of a player. In medieval times, there were no rules on how many players there could be. Sometimes it was even whole towns versus one another. The ball? <laughs> Not something you can find in the back of your favorite department store. It was an inflated pig bladder. Ugh. The only goal was to get it to the other side with any means necessary, which oftentimes meant it was going to get physical. 
A lot, a lot of beating and whatnot, a lot of hitting. Not very good, don't do that. I'll stick uh, not playing that sport, thanks. At number seven, Satan's Incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12-year-old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. 
Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, Grand Theft Witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Number 10, shaming parades. If you've watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked, while someone behind her is ringing a bell chanting shame. Ding, ding, ding. Shame. It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's kind of human nature at this point, and obviously back then, they didn't have social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary, but the one thing that stayed consistent was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the streets and forced to drink the beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded, and it was quite the spectacle. Now, would you rather experience this or being cancelled on social media? And number nine, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well, if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place where everyone goes for fun. The cemetery. Yeah, you're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husbands. Although corpse, if you're watching, hit me up. I love you. 
Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then, people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, and it was almost like the equivalent to going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the Dark Ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. Before I carry on talking about the weirdest parts of life from the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. And number 8, Judging Tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with the idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS, and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the Dark Ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and the frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been different kinds of tears, which they called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overwhelmed with emotion that they would be moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it wasn't disturbing anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like, really, was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know... Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 1560. 61, which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed 
their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, Plague Bear. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the Dark Ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? You can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s. But when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? Because anything we learned the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation, ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages, yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go, keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale, there you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back, so. <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you'd leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this was a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest at least that's what French writer Francois Maximilian Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals. They wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built really, really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Prajemski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? 
I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you wanna do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmeted cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They'd pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they'd glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked! Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to receive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably, and if you didn't, it was looked down on, but then again, you were also dead, so what does that matter? But it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death, the victim, who was stabbed in the head, always had like a calm expression, which is like, yeah, this is fine. It's a flesh wound. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well, and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes, and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable. Honestly, hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow Capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually. Yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid. It was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and Everything, water plus pain, it's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard, anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and i whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just 
nothing. No one will even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away at your little piggies were, number three, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat. That's cool, but maybe cover Stuart Little's eyes for this one. Rats as a medieval punishment, where do I even start? Okay, this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time. What was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the braking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big, closed cauldron. And usually, it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie, too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just, they just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with the light. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you wanna be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. Johnny Depp needs your help right now. So maybe, maybe be a lawyer, call him up. Say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight. And like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Oh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of Black Plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number eight, ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns, 
whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party. That was a good joke, Adam wrote that one. You had to be there whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learning useful skills and could be a great career choice. It could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home. And your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. At number seven, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day to day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cupbearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cupbearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business but also for the good of their families. 
Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the ale life was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. At number 10, watching consummation. Back in medieval times, depending on the century, weddings either meant a lot or meant nothing at all. If it was the early medieval age, then no one really gave a hoot about marriage, and I'll get to that later, but but later in the medieval age, marriage became a holy sacrament, and this sacrament had to be consummated. On the night of the couple's wedding, they would do the good old brown chicken, brown cow, boom boom pow, <laughs> OMG wow, which could have been a positive or negative experience depending on circumstance, but it was also a little weird because there would be people watching it all happen. That's right guys, after the ceremony and reception, people would follow the bride and groom up to the bedroom and be like, hey Joe, grab the popcorn, we're watching the live showing of Fifty Shades of Grey. And Joe would be like, yo, bet. And then that's exactly how it happened. Anyways, this was all done so that there were witnesses to the consummation so that the marriage's validity could be backed up. So if anyone tried to deny that their marriage was legit, Joe with the popcorn would be able to back up the bride and groom and confirm that everything happened. Kinda kinky, kinda weird. Number nine, dowries. Today's weddings are in so insanely expensive. I don't know if it's ever gonna happen for me for that reason alone. But uh, you know, they kind of replaced the dowry altogether. But what was a dowry? It was a set of assets, money, material, goods, real estate that would be given to the groom once the couple united. The purpose of the dowry was to entice a groom to marry the bride if he wasn't already attracted to her. A kind of, we will pay you to marry our daughter kind of vibes. But it also acts as a kind of insurance for the bride. Should the marriage end in divorce, the husband is expected to pay it back. So yes, there were indeed take backsies if things got really bad. Though considering divorce and annulments were rare and the money really never belonged to her, not the best rule to live by, but the groom would also pay something called the bride price or bride wealth. The groom was expected to pay a sum either in assets or money to secure a lady's hand in marriage. This implied security for the bride and their family. But yes, in both accounts, technically, a bride could be bought and sold for whatever price the family slash groom deemed appropriate. So really just a marriage pawn. At number eight, shotgun wedding. Marriage and weddings back in the medieval ages were practiced very differently compared to today. Back then, then people started getting married and having kids very, very young. Usually girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, so around the age of 12, and they would start popping out as many spawn as possible because the high infant mortality rate made it very difficult to grow a family. On top of the duty to further the population, these marriages weren't for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or alliances, or because your dad owed Billy from down the block a favor and he offered you to his son Billy Jr. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriage wasn't as big of a fuss as it is now, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. You could get engaged in the morning and be married by lunchtime if you really wanted to. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies could be held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. 
Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell or spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle, and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steel Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sounds just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey, Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend, who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you. Or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number four, arranged marriages. All this stuff sounds awful. And you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promised daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number three, marital disputes. I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I have to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is, it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part, and depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yieldy times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. 
Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's, no, you guys won't. You guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So, here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead, here you go. Crazy.